Driving every corner of our global economy is code. I'm John Shuchuk, technical fellow at Microsoft. In this series, we'll discuss the key issues in software and take a peek at the hottest tools with the industry's key players. This is Decoded. Welcome to Seattle, the Pacific Northwest's mighty hub of innovation. Home to some of the world's most dynamic organizations and the ideal location to explore our first topic, responsive user interfaces. I'm here with Jacob Thornton, one of the co-inventors of Bootstrap. Jacob, how'd you get started with Bootstrap? About 2011, 2012, my good friend Marco Otto and I started working at Twitter and we started working on this problem. How can we bring beautiful, consistent UI across both our internal and our external apps? And we try to do that by, you know, bringing together design and engineering in a consistent way and melding those two methodologies. Bootstrap's been incredibly successful. You're the number one project on GitHub, forked over 10,000 times. Mm. What's the magic? Why do people like it? One thing that we try really hard to do is use technologies that people are already familiar with. We've worked really closely with the jQuery team. We also were using Less, and now in Bootstrap 4, as the community has shifted to SAS, we too will be moving to SAS. We also bring a lot of extra stuff in from the community. We have a super engaged Twitter audience, and also now a Slack channel, which is just people are giving us feedback left and right. I think it's time that we try out some code and let's see it in action. So to start, what we've done is we've created a GitHub project. That project's got some basic stuff in it. Let's now go create one of our initial web pages. So why don't you clone this and we'll get going. I'm just gonna grab this uh, SSH URL real quick, pop into my workspace and clone it. And I'm just gonna start right away by creating a simple index.html file and opening that in Sublime. Maybe for the first thing we do, why don't we create something like a toolbar, which is very common in a lot of applications. How would you go about doing something like that? For sure. So the first thing I would do, obviously, is write some HTML. And then I'm going to pop over to the Bootstrap documentation to uh, grab the actual Bootstrap library. And I'm just going to drop that in the head there. For the navbar, um, it's really straightforward. So it's just a single div, class equals navbar. And let's do navbar default to begin with. Let's, for a little more contrast, switch it to inverse. And you'll also notice the rounded corners on the edges there. One thing you're doing if you're having this static uh, navbar up across the top is actually just add just that, which is navbar static top. And that's going to remove the corners for you. Let's just do something really simple. And let's add, add like a branding type element. Uh, we want this on the left side. And we want uh, a link. Um, this is kind of the common sort of title type element you see, a Twitter or a Facebook or something of that nature. And we're just going to call that navbar branding. And let's just call our amazing app brand, because why not? That's one example of the kind of components that are in there, but there's a lot. Yeah. Um, pretty typical one that most people will often put at the top of a page is kind of a banner, mm -hmm. giving people a welcome message, that kind of thing. So let's take a look at at that in action. To do that, the first thing I would probably do is add one of our containers. So we have two types of containers. We have uh, a regular container, which is going to break at our different breakpoints with uh, static sizes. And then we also have our container fluid, which is going to be 100% width with slight padding. For this specific example, I think just a regular container is going to be best. And then inside of that, just really simple, I would add the Jumbotron element. The first thing that I usually add to my Jumbotrons is going to be some sort of heading type element. You can just call this like Hello World. And also often like a description or something of that nature. So I'm just going to add some quick uh, lorem ipsum in there. Maybe also a button for good measure. This is going to be our primary button because there's, it's the only button on the page. And actually, let's also make it button large. So there, there, there's a handful of other modifiers that you can play with as you really dive into it. And you it. just add them as classes on divs and, or buttons, and you're good to go. Yep, or anchors or anything you want. Just for right now, button primary should probably do the job. I will just call this, we'll just say button primary action, and we'll make it title case, because that's what all the cool kids do. And Looking there you have good. it. We spend hours on top of hours obsessing about documentation. We'll throw something out if we feel like it's just too hard to get going. And we're constantly listening to feedback from our users, and we're really trying to bring all that in. Often when you're working with a partner and you're building a sophisticated application, you'd love to start with a pattern that 
we know works and is able to pull things together. Tell me a little bit about the master recipe that you use when you sit down and try and build something. I usually like to start with design and really getting you know, a really good feel for what's going on there. Uh, typically this means working hand in hand with a designer to kind of abstract out the different scales and components that they already have in place. Once we've done that, we typically take the typography scale and the color scale, uh, grid systems, and different components that are already uh, present in the design and really try to make them work within the Bootstrap ecosystem. This really helps us evolve the app over time as well as move really fast once we all get it kind of in place. Now, one of the most powerful things you introduced was this notion of a grid. And by default, you break up the page into these 12 columns and then depending on the size of the screen, you can have our columns span 12 parts of that grid. In other words, cover the whole thing or maybe only six parts of the grid, which would be 50%. Gives you this ability to create these really dynamic placements of text. Why don't we see an example of a grid in action? Let's just keep working within the same container and let's create what are called rows. So rows are gonna divide up your content into rows, as you might imagine. And um, inside of that, again, we're gonna have columns. And so you will just see something like div class call hyphen. And then after this is usually the responsive breakpoint that you were talking about a little bit. There's large, medium, small, and extra small. And those correspond to mobile, up to tablet size, up to kind of PC size. So let's just start right away with targeting desktop browsers. So we might say column large and let's do uh, three. And this is gonna be uh, one fourth of 12 is three. Yep. Covers three columns of that 12 column grid. Exactly. I'm just going to create four of them and show you what that looks like. So right away you'll notice four columns split it across our current container that we're working within, which is also causing the uh, dimensions of the Jumbotron that we created be, uh, before to be kind of contained. And it's important to note that Bootstrap is mobile first. And what that means is that because I've only defined for the large and not for the smaller devices, as soon as we break out of that breakpoint, they're gonna automatically go to a 12, 100% width div. So if we wanted to change that, for example, we could do call sm6, uh, and this is going to break it into two columns and then eventually a single column. Here's this page sensing the size, moving elements around, getting things lined up, all kind of automatically, just declaratively. Almost every project I do now starts with a Git, and I really couldn't live without it. Beyond that, if I'm building a web application, I'm gonna start needing to use things like Node.js, typically in the JavaScript kind of world. After that, of course, Bootstrap or some other framework. And I also like to get my hands dirty with different uh, build systems like Gulp or Grunt to help automate a lot of these common workflows. Lastly, if I'm doing some sort of MVC type thing, uh, AngularJS or uh, Ember or something of that nature, I find really, really helpful in just making these things come to life. I think just to clean this up and make it feel a little more happy, I'd like to uh, play around with these things we call panels. Yeah. And we'll just create the default ones. Again, you can have different modifiers on these. And we're also gonna want to have like some sort of heading. Let's just say, go Warriors for fun times. And uh, panel body. And just to show you what that looks like is you get this kind yeah. of simple little card type uh, entity. Duplicate this code that I just wrote and just not caring about indenting at all. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Now just squeeze it over and we yep. can see it automatically switch to the two column for the small. What I want to do now is let's get this thing out on the web. Yeah. So you're in GitHub. Why don't you check that in? We'll do a git add and then a commit. And up here on GitHub, I've already set this up. Um, I've got a very, very simple server. I happen to be using Node.js to do this. This is this great thing we were talking about, the ability to use JavaScript on the client, JavaScript on the server. I'm not really doing anything complicated. I'm leveraging Express to just serve up the files. We then tell it anything that's in the file system we'll use, and so that'll serve up Jacob's file, and then we set up the port and we listen on it. That's already been pushed up there, and we happen to be using Azure Websites, which has continuous deployment from GitHub. So as we work on GitHub, automatically Azure is listening to that through a webhook, and we can see it live. In fact, let's just take a quick look at our site live up on the web, and there is Jacob's code. Very nice. 
give us an example of one of the worst user interfaces you've encountered. Oh, uh, yeah. The ones that really jump out in my mind are going to be the ones from uh, the early 90s, where these applications have gone through a series of redesigns, and they've really been thought through from the ground up a couple times, and they've missed little corners of the app. So you might be on the main page and then go into the settings and be hit with different typography, colors, or things like that, which just kind of throw you out of the rhythm and make you kind of second guess what's going on, yeah. on actually. On the other hand, what's a great application that you know about or have worked on? My favorite right now is actually medium.com. I feel like they've just done a really great job coming up with a consistent sort of design language, and they do a really good job polishing things, so it feels kind of whole and like complete. You worked on medium. Are there any kind of learnings that you had, any tips or tricks that you could share with people? First, use a framework. I didn't like uh, think that would be a thing that I'd ever really have to say, but I even catch myself not doing that on occasion. The next two that jump to mind immediately are grid systems, which are mm -hmm. just so valuable, and then also use scales, so type scales, color scales, and things of that nature, which is just gonna help limit the amount of variables. You don't want a website with thousands of colors and things of that nature. So now that we have this great responsive web app, let's actually go build some mobile apps. Now to make that really easy, there's a great open source project called Manifold JS that can be used to automatically generate a W3C manifest, which is used to in turn drive that application on a bunch of mobile platforms. To use this, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can just do an NPM install, uh, dash G Manifold JS, and that'll come down like any of the Node.js projects. Um, I've already done that, so let me just actually now just type in the command. So it is creating a default W3C manifest, it's constructing that, and it's building all of these projects. After this is finished baking, what we end up with is a mobile app. Here is that mobile app with your content up and running here on an Android phone. As you can see, the layout that you did looks great. It also runs on the iOS phone, the Windows phone, and many others. So that responsive capability that Jacob created is now being leveraged to create very quickly mobile responsive web apps. Yeah, it looks awesome. What am I excited about for the future of code? Speed, going faster, doing more in less time and making that stuff better. There's things like Babel and Post CSS and all these things which are actually allowing us to write as though we were already in the future. Browsers don't have to be the bottleneck anymore and we can really try out these new technologies before uh, they're even implemented. I want you to be able to go out there and build a beautiful interface. I want it to work across browsers, across devices, and I want you to feel like you can do this. There's amazing tools out there, and you can use them. They're free, and there's tons of support. There's amazing community, and everyone's just kind of waiting for you to come up with something. So go out there. You can do this. Make something awesome. Stay tuned as we look at all aspects of application architecture. We'll share best practices and continue the conversation with the industry's key players. Next time on Decoding.